Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by David Schlossberg, who is in Oregon. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Spectacular. Fantastic. And uh, uh, David is from the Ferguson Alliance, uh, who helps family business prosper. And what we're going to talk about today is how to build highly functioning um, sales teams. So, David, one of the things that I, I want to ask you is, uh, over the last couple of years and everything that we've been through, are there, uh, have you changed the approach at all to building high, you know, high performing sales teams? Are there other things that you take into account or is, uh, or is it still pretty much the same as what you've been doing up to now? It's actually the same as what we've been doing up to now, only more, more of it. So the, the fact that everyone is working remotely um it allows uh allows us to even operate more efficiently and more effectively i believe because you're you're able to connect with people uh from all over the world really uh via zoom or via you know uh by the by the web mm -hmm. and so the the just because of the shift in the mindset of how we operate and interact from from prior to COVID to how we do it now is has really I think helped um, helped our profession to be more effective and efficient. So, for example, you can do a presentation with a client. You can organize that presentation in a matter of a day and be there just in in real short time versus what had been tr traditionally a kind of a long drawn out process of pulling it together a presentation, getting an appointment, traveling to the buyer's location, all that sort of thing. So in that respect, I think it's been a, a real positive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and have you, um, have you seen like salespeople really embrace this now? Because at the beginning there was, there was, you know, there was a lot of salespeople who had been doing virtual selling and all of that was fine, but there were some who were relatively new to it. Um, and, uh, some of them maybe didn't embrace it immediately, you know, even switching on cameras, all of that. I mean, have you seen now that people are starting to understand that virtual selling is its own almost, you know, you have your already, already you have your sales skills, but you have additional things you need to bring to the equation when you're doing it virtually. Um, well, abs absolutely. Being, becoming familiar with the technology and become more, be, being, becoming more adept at, uh, developing an effect uh, an effective presentation and working with uh being able to work with your resources internally at your company to make sure you have the tools that you need in place to to make an effective presentation i think that's all and especially with you know what i found the um the millennial generation is more much more adept to that than say the folks from my generation which this a lot of this has all been new a new process and new technology for us to adapt to and, and, and really embrace. So are there any, are there any particular approaches that are, are even more um, effective now? Because a lot of things you hear about is people talking about connection, authenticity, these kind of, uh, you know, that they want, they want to really connect with the salesperson. They really want to like feel that they're authentic, that they're interested. I mean, these things that, yeah, maybe that's always been true, but it seems to be a little bit more of a heightened sensitivity around it right now. Yeah, I think you struck on something very, uh, very important. And what I'm, what I'm seeing uh, a need for is that uh, the ability of, for a salesperson to make a connection uh, with with that uh, potential client uh, on the other end of the uh, on the other end of that connection. So, um, and that's some some of the people new to the, this way of selling may find that a little difficult. But it's all about trying to find some common ground to start a conversation and. Uh, to really uh, to do that, it requires asking a lot of questions. So you need to be curious and and uh, and find areas where you can probe with questioning to open up a, a dialogue and a conversation to find you know find areas of common interest where you can connect personally on a personal level. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that takes uh, time and practice. 
Yeah, no, it, it does take time and practice. And I think the other thing is that it is uh, it is a little bit kind of almost counterculture today is to uh, um, not just ask her questions, but the active listening part, because, you know, we're so distracted nowadays and everything's popping up and buzzing. And we're we're and, and people are even fine like to be having a conversation like face to face with somebody and halfway through glance down at their text to go. Oh, OK, um, so, you know, that there's not a lot of active listening going on, but that that's such a critical component. And I think that's something that a lot of people either need to learn for the first time or relearn is real active listening. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I recall a, a, a uh, an experience that I had oh, probably you know six or seven years ago. This was before COVID, and we were mm -hmm. I was uh, I was working with a new uh, sales, um, actually a regional sales manager, and we, um, you know, this gentleman was uh, from the from the millennial generation, and and as you described was. Uh, very connected to the to his personal um, his personal device, his phone, um, right. and sitting in a, a meeting, one on one in person meeting, making a making a presentation to a uh, pretty fairly important client, and I'm um, I'm looking over there, and, and this guy is you know looking down at his phone, and he's he's responding to a, ch a chat on his um, on his phone, and after you know after the meeting, I said to him, I said, hey, look, you know, one of the things, one of my pet peeves is when you're when we're in a meeting and in a pre presentation that you're present and mm. you're not uh, you're not you're not filling around with your your cell phone and, and responding to text messages that's uh you know maybe that's okay for you in, on a social basis but on a professional level it's really yeah. distracting and uh and then i you know as as time went on i came to find out it was more prevalent than i ever imagined just it was seemed to be um and i mean it, it, we all know that we're so connected to our phones. It's a real easy and real natural tendency to look down at your phone when you're in a meeting and respond to a text message. But uh, you're, when you do that, you're disconnecting um, mm -hmm. and you're distracted. So you're really not, as you say, you're not engaged in that uh, focused, active listening. And I think it makes a big difference from the person on the other side when they observe that. Yeah, no, 100%. Because, I mean, when they observe that it, it's either if they feel like they have your undivided attention then that's a great credentialing it's very it's respectful it creates the right environment mm -hmm. if they think you're not then you, you get the opposite and one other thing I, w I wanted to ask you uh, about David is um, I'm building a team hiring hiring is obviously really critically important getting the right right people especially you know getting the right sales people but i feel like it's still something that all of us have a pretty patchy track record with um <laughs> i i can guarantee you i mean just not even sales just hiring in general i guarantee you like i've made more hiring mistakes than i've made uh you know every so often you you know even a what's it to say even a blind pig finds a truffle once in a while so every so often you get a <laughs> you get one that knocks it out of the park and you like to take credit for it but to be honest, like you know, there's a lot of others that that didn't. What? How do? How can you get hiring of salespeople right? Because it it is so critical and it is kind of hard, to be honest. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's very hard, and and um, I think the one of the hardest things for us to overcome is our our natural instincts to uh, when you meet someone that um, <clears throat> uh, you you have that uh, sort of chemistry or that that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, seem to seem to bond well with, and so you follow your gut instinct and tend to overlook um, real red flags or real warning signs. And, and and hey, look, you know, one of the one of the toughest things to do is interview a interview someone for a sales position because that person that is it, that you're interviewing is a salesperson. So what do they do? They sell. Yeah. They sell themselves. So they're and they're good at yeah. it. Um, so you have to, I think, uh, um, develop a profile of what is the you know what are the criteria or the or the personality um, strengths that you're looking for in a potential sales candidate, and, and how do you determine that? Well, one way you determine that is you think about your clients or your customer, and what's the profile of your customer, and what kind of selling is required. You know, is it is it transactional selling um, products, or is it relationship selling? Is it um, short? uh you know quick transaction sale or mm -hmm. is it a long 
long tail, you know, a, a longer sales cycle. And so you, you kind of kind of line up the personality and the skills with the client and also the, the type of business and what it is you're selling or what it, whether it's a product or a service. Um, so that has, all those pieces have to fit. And that's, I think a good place to start is develop that profile, the ideal sales candidate you're looking for that fits your business and your, your sales cycle and fits your, your client or your customer. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice because I was talking to somebody earlier about the similar things around hiring. And I think avoid, as you said, build your profile, but I think avoid just going and lifting a profile off the internet and just saying, oh, okay, this will do, or I'll tweak it a little bit because I don't think in that case, you're going to put a thought into what the correct salesperson looks like for you. Um, right. And I just think that's something that we trap we often fall into is just going, oh, we'll just make this easy on ourselves. We'll find the profile and just tweak it. Um, whereas, as I said, I think we need to you know, actually create your own because it'll force you to ask ask questions. Um, the other thing I think, David, as well, is um, when it comes to hiring, I mean, sometimes we tend to hire the same type of person, right? So we hire like a bunch of very similar people. And I know you would argue that having a, a more mixed and diverse set of skills and, and types in a sales team is, is, is more effective. Um, absolutely. Um, you've got, uh, um, you, you've, the most effective sales teams have all, have different, they have different types of salespeople uh, with respect to, you know, your kind of your A, A player and B player and C player. Um, you got the, you know, the, the sales, sales leader, the sales killer, who's, uh, you know, really, uh, leading the pack, um, uh, leading, killing it on all aspects. And then you've got the, the B player who's more methodical in their approach, more consistent, uh, and they may not have the same um yeah you know, they may not have the same charismatic approach to selling that your lead guy does but you need a you need a balance to be effective because uh the customer base isn't going to always match up well with that a player that's your your high performance very competitive salesperson versus mm -hmm. your b player you you've got to be able to have that diversity so you're able to line up the customer needs with the appropriate salesperson and it could also ha have to do with the territory and how the the territory is uh set up but um having a diverse group of salespeople is i think much more effective than you know hiring all the same clones that go out there and sell for you yeah and absolutely and then the other part the other part too is um actually investing in those salespeople, like training them making sure that they have the resources because i feel there's another one i mean Sales salespeople don't get enough training. I mean, yeah, you bring them into your organization, they get product training, but actually sales training and selling and and role playing and coaching and working with their manager, a lot of that is missing in a lot of sales organizations because yeah, it may get talked about, but then it gets filed under, yeah, we'll get around to that someday, but we're too busy selling right now. But um for mm -hmm. you, like how how critical is the training component? Um, well, it's very critical because you want to start from day one. You want to uh, be able to have a repeatable, um, um, yeah, an effective, repeatable approach to selling and be able to te show that to someone. Um, it's as it's, it's fundamental and basic as uh, writing down your sales process from step, from point of uh, when a lead comes into your funnel to the close so that you can use that as a kind of a foundation to from which you train from and then i i think it's um you know the sales seminars i've done these with companies where they bring in an outside coach and they do the sure. you know they do the one or two day sales seminar and it's everybody gets hyped up and you do role playing and it's a, you know it's it's a lot of fun it's interesting you do pick up some skills but i think the real work in training and developing sales people is done um as um as a where you you as the supervisor, the sales yeah. manager is the coach, and you're working with that salesperson one on one, be it uh, doing a joint visit, uh, um, making a sales call together, and then giving feedback at the end of the sales call on what worked, what were the takeaways. I think that 
that real experience of the hands-on training is much more effective in the long run. No, absolutely. I would agree because it has to be embedded at the point of impact and it has to be reinforced as you right. go. Um, one other thing that you mentioned there that I just wanted to pick up on is the idea of sales process because here's another thing. Like I've come across organizations and you can say, oh, show me your sales process and they'll go, yeah, uh, I, well, we have one somewhere here and say, oh, here it is. And you go, but you know, we put this together years ago. It hasn't really been updated. Uh, I don't think people realize like how dynamic a sales process should be and that it's something that you should be tweaking, revisiting, validating on an ongoing basis because uh, you know, your selling process, well, that's fine, but the buying process changes, buyer taste change, buyer habits mm -hmm. change, new generations come into the workforce, all of that. So um, talk to me a little bit about the, the sale, about sales process and how important it is to really focus on making sure your sales process is constantly being validated or evaluated? Um, so that's a really good, you know, really good question. Some, you make some really good points um, on the importance of uh, con continuously updating your sales process or tweaking your sales process. And um, one way I like to go about this is to initially take a Look at it from the standpoint of the customer and what are their needs and is asking yourself the question is, are you serving your customer? Um, uh, and are you, are you helping your customer, uh, to solve their problem or be successful through your, uh, the way you're approaching your sales process. And one way to do that is through a simple survey at the, the beginning of a sales cycle or the beginning of the year where you, where you survey your customers and ask them, you know, it's, it's, a um, a simple, basic question of, you know, how are, how are we doing kind of a survey? And that gets, that's oftentimes gives you the, some of the best feedback that you will need or want to have to tweak your sales process. The other way is to include it and involve your entire team. Um, maybe not everyone altogether, but certainly the representatives who are probably the, the most adept at using the sales process or most effective with the sales process. So some of your salespeople, your sales managers, customer service, uh, your marketing people, have them give you feedback and do a uh, basically, you know, a collaborative meeting where you're mapping out that sales process and looking for the gaps and saying, okay, based on our customers and their profile and their needs, you know, these are the gaps that we see in our sales process. Or, you know, something as simple and basic as, you know, hey, the sales process we're using we really need to have an app on our phone. So when we're talking with a customer in the field, we can pull up all the information and data that they need right away. Something as basic as that might be missing. Yeah. Um, no, I did. That's a great point. And I think uh, that it's funny how we often forget to ask, forget that our customers are such a font of knowledge for us and can really guide us in the right direction. Uh, I remember doing this, doing a talk a number of years ago and talk about changing buyer behavior. And somebody in the audience said, well, how do we find out? And I said, ask your customers. Ask them if, how they like to buy. Has the way they buy, yep. the way they buy today changed from the way they bought, bought last year or the year before? Um, and so I think that's a great point because I think people often overlook uh, the fact that your customers are a wealth of, of a fount of knowledge for you if you if you want them actually take advantage of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one last thing, uh, one last quick, quick question, uh, David, before we go, and that is um, metrics. Uh, you know, it's it's great to train people. It's great to have your sales process, but you've got to see how your your folks are performing. But we live in an age today where you can go over the top on the amount of things you measure. So what are some of the critical KPIs that you you look at? Um, well, I think one way to, one place to start or where I've started in the past is like you said, you can overload, uh, everyone with data. And I think it's, it's good to sit down with your, uh, your lead salespeople, um, and customer service and ask them for feedback on, you know, what is it, what is it they would like to, what data would they like to see to help them measure how they're performing in their business. And it can mm -hmm. be different from, from one salesperson to the next, depending on what they're looking at. Obviously there's 
fundamentals that we're all looking at in terms of the, the macro level, you know, increases in sales or activity of customers, you know, but I think the, when you want to get more in detail, it's, it's all about tweaking that dashboard to really fit the, the needs of that sales rep. Because if they're, if you're shoving data down their throat, that's stuff that they don't really look at or, or don't use to help them um, be more successful, it, it just becomes noise. And you got to, you only have so much time with these folks when you're doing a one-on-one -on -one and you want to be able to really drill into what's, what's really effective. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And I'm glad you mentioned that actually about uh, uh, the salesperson, um, their own metrics and what they measure. That's one of the key things that when we were building Pipeline CRM is that we made sure that all of the analytical tools that the managers have are also available to the salesperson to be able to analyze and manage their own book of business as well because let's face it we, we sales people are the entrepreneurs within an organization we call them salespreneurs right. so I, I i'm great that you pulled that point out because i think that's a critical point for people it's not just about management measuring and putting together a dashboard or kpi it's also allowing your salespeople to have and be, have the tools and be able to measure the things that are important to them and the things that they track in order to uh, make sure that they are they're delivering well listen uh, david this has been great all of david's information is going to be below this video uh, but before we go david please tell people a little bit more about you and what you do so i am a, a business advisor and i work with uh, two co of my colleagues um, rob ferguson and brandy uh, merrick and so you can act, you can find us on our website at uh, fergusonalliance.com and we offer a wide range of services and everything from succession planning to exit planning, um, strategic planning, uh, as well as sales coaching and, and sales development. So we would be happy to talk to you. Just uh, reach out to us and we will get in touch with you. Yeah, great. Thank you, David. And as I said, all the information will be below this video. So um, thanks again for watching and listening. Thank you, David, for the insights. And I you will bet. see you all again soon.